Anatoly Bukrev was a Russian mountaineer who climbed some of the highest peaks on earth in his lifetime. He was one of the toughest mountaineers of all time with an extraordinary stamina as compared to his contemporaries. He made some of the most incredible ascent in the history of mountaineering. His expeditions were life-threatening because of avalanches, blizzards, and many other mountaineering obstacles. But his love for mountains was much greater than any hindrance that came up his way. He successfully climbed 11 of the 14 8,000 meter peaks without the aid of bottle oxygen. His daring effort to save fellow climbers in the blizzard of 1996 on Everest is considered one of the greatest displays of courage and determination in the history of mountaineering rescues. But his spirited life came to an end when he was killed in an avalanche on the south base of Annapurna in December 1997. His body was never found which could be understood as his final act of devotion toward his cathedral, the mountains. He regarded the mountain as his place of worship and he became immortal through his passion for mountaineering which ultimately took his life. Anatoly Bukhrib was born on the 16th of January 1958 in Kurkino, Chelyabinsk, Russian Federation to the family of Nikolai Vasilevich Bukhrib and Valentina Andreevna Bukhriva. He was the third child in a large family where his father repaired musical instruments and his mother worked in a local club. His parents were both four. Anatoly Bukhrib had four siblings. Alexander Bukhrib, Nikolai Bukhrib, Livov Bukhriva, and Irina Bukhriva. Anatoly Bukhrib studied at Kurkenu Secondary General School No. 2, where he graduated in 1975. After high school, he got enrolled at the Chelyabinsk University for Pedagogy and graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics in 1979. At the same time, he also completed a coaching program for cross-country skiing and studied mountain climbing. After graduation, he moved to Kazakhstan and called up for military service in the Soviet Army, 1979-1981. He was sent to the sports troops of the Central Asian Military District. While serving in the army, he fell ill with meningitis which was the reason for him being expelled from the Central Asian Military District team. His mother, Valentina Andreevna, went to Kazakhstan to care for her son and remember that from weakness he could hardly get to his feet and move, holding on the wall in a room in the dormitory. At the same time, he refused to return home deciding to improve his life in the Union Republic. The doctor at the military hospital wanted to commission him and forbade him to play sports, but he asked him not to do it and gave time for rehabilitation. Anatoly began to self-medicate, starvation, yoga, exercise and put himself on his feet in six months. After being discharged to the reserve, he stayed in Kazakhstan and lived near Almata. He worked at the Central Army Sport Club as a skiing coach in the regional children's sports schools, as well as an instructor in mountain climbing training, which led him combining work with his passion for mountaineering. He began serious ascents conquering the peaks in the Tian Shan mountain range. 
1995, he became part of a Kazakhstani mountaineering team in order to pursue his dream of mountain climbing. The doctors who banned him from any physical activity probably didn't believe their eyes. As part of various expeditions, he conquered all the main peaks of the Soviet Union. Members of those expeditions noted that Anatoly never used oxygen, demonstrated phenomenal endurance and climbing speed. Naturally, Anatoly Bokri became one of the candidates for the conquest of one of the 8,000 meters mountains of the Himalayas as part of the Soviet delegation. In 1987, he accomplished his first solo ascent of the Lenin Fik on the border of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. In April 1989, Bokrib climbed the third highest peak on Earth, Kanchenchunga, via a new route with Second Soviet Himalayan Expedition. Later, during that same expedition, he made the traverse up all four peaks of the massif of Kanchenjunga. It was then that he used oxygen for the only time in all his essence, because Soviet climbers, for whose preparation a lot of money was allocated, were not entitled even to the slightest mistakes. At that time, it was an unparalleled traverse and took the group only three days. All participants of that expedition became known all over the world. And Bukrip even received an invitation from the United States to the International Mountain Film Festival. He went there at the expense of the organizers in March 1990 and met the best climbers in the world. It was then that Anatoly Bukhrib clearly imagined his future life. He became a high altitude guide, gaining experience, conquering new heights himself and helping to conquer others. Bukri became something of a global nomad in pursuit of both mountains and money to take in meat. In order to scrape together a living, he hired an as a guide in the Himalaya, Alaska, and Kazakhstan. Gibbs slide shows in American climbing shops and occasionally resorted to common labor. But all the while, he continued to tell an extraordinary record of high altitude ascents. In February 1990, Bokrib made the first winter ascent at Peak Foivda, 7,400 meters. Later in April, he went along with American climbers on the ascent of Mount McKinley, also known as Denali the highest mountain peak in North America. The expedition was a success and the team reached the summit and returned without incident. After the team had returned home, Bokriep decided to attempt a solo split ascent of Denali before returning to the Soviet Union. Bokriep's solo split ascent of Denali in 1990 was completed in about 10 hours from the base to the summit. That season, acclimatized climbers were normally taking three to four days and five came to summit. Bokriyev's speed was noted by Climbing Magazine's a 1990 issue and commented on by Denali Park Rangers who described it as unreal. That same year, he also climbed El Capitan and Hantengri. After the collapse of Soviet Union in 1991, he remained in Kazakhstan and received dual Russian-Kazakhstani citizenship. In the 1990s, he moved to the United States. He spent most of his time in Nepal, and when he was out of the mountains, he lived in the United States with his friend Linda Wiley, 
whom he met in one of the village cafes in the Himalayas. In the spring of 1991, Bokreb climbed Dalugeri along the western wall. That same year, he successfully completed his first climbing expedition to the highest peak on Earth, Mount Everest via the South Girl Road. In May 1993, Anatoly Bukrib climbed Mount McKinley. Later that same year in July, he summited K2, one of the toughest and most dangerous 8,000 in the world. He reached the summit on the 1st of July 1993 where the Abruz is for, where he shared the summit with team members Peter Metzger from Germany and Andrew Locke from Australia. Other team members in that expedition were Raymond Joswick, team leader, and Ernst Eberhardt. K2 is notorious for its unpredictable weather conditions, steep pyramidal relief, dropping quickly in almost all directions, and the inherent dangers in climbing it. Bukriev found himself in a dangerous position during that ascent, when his teammates suggested climbing the summit without taking any rest. He had expended too much energy placing fax lines along a narrow steep portion earlier that day. He was exhausted and out of energy for the ascent. He was reluctant at first but agreed to climb and thus on reaching the summit, he was so physically and emotionally drained that he did not feel the joy of victory. Pukrib would later write, During my years of training as a ski racer and then as a mountaineer, I had learned how to wring out the last of my energy for a finish. But this is dangerous in mountaineering. Because the summit is not the finish line of your competition with a great mountain. To survive, you must be able to get down from the forbidden zone. Bukreep later described feeling like a squeezed lemon. When Bukreep and the other two climbers began their descent just after sundown, they met Rain Morjaswick ascending and near the peak. Relying heavily on intuition and his previous mountaineering experiences, Bukreep slowly made his way down the steep rock and ice of the mountain. A crampon kept coming up his boot, and at one point he had to use his ice axe to arrest a fall, keeping himself from sliding down into the abyss. Eventually, he made his way down to the tents at the highest elevation. However, his teammates, Peter Metzger and Ren Marjaswick, fell to their deaths during the descent. Next year, in 1994, Bokreep climbed Makalu, the fifth highest mountain in the world, whose shape is a four sided pyramid. He reached the summit on the 15th of May 1994. In 1995, Anatoly Bukri made the fastest ascent record on Dalugeri in 17 hours 15 minutes. Same year, he again climbed Mount Everest, this time via the North Ridge Route. On the 30th of June 1995, Anatoly Bukrib acted as a personal guide to the then president of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, and helped him climb the peak of 4,010 meters. That same year, on the 8th of December 1995, he successfully climbed Manaslo. In December of the same year, Bukreep accepted the offer of his good friend Scott Fisher, the owner of the Mountain Madness Company. 
Fisher wanted him as a guide for his commercial expedition to Everest in 1996. In 1996, there were more climbers on the south side of Mount Everest than ever before. There was a Taiwanese team of 13, a South African team of 21, a nine-man team of British, Danish and Finnish climbers, an American team of six, a 12-person IMAX expedition, Scott Fisher's Mountain Madness team of 24, and Rob Hall's Adventure Consultant team of 26. Anatoly Bukhrib was the lead climbing guide for the Mountain Madness expedition headed by Scott Fisher. The expedition had eight clients whom each had paid around $65,000 for a fully guided summit attempt up Mount Everest. Members of Mountain Madness expedition were Scott Fisher, USA leader and head guide. Anatoly Bukhrev, Russia, guide. Neil Bidelman, USA, guide. Dr. Ingrid Hunt, USA, base camp manager and team doctor. Lap Singh Jangbu Sherpa, Nepal, climbing Sardar. Cindy Helfetman, USA, client and journalist. Charlotte Fox, USA, client. Tim Madsen, USA, client. Pete Schoening, USA, client. Pete Schoening had been part of the 1953 K2 expedition yet unclimbed at the time. They turned back to save the life of a climber who had developed a blood clot. On the descent, Shawning likely saved the lives of five other climbers by a spectacular ice ex arrest when climbers began falling off, after one of them lost his balance. Clip Shawning, USA Client Lini Gemmelgaard Denmark client Martin Adams USA client Dr. Dale Cruz USA client personal friend of Fisher for many years Jane Bromit USA journalist In addition there were 10 surfers assisting the expedition including base camp Sardar climbing surfers and cooks. Rob Hall's adventure consultant expedition consisted of eight fan clients and three guides. Rob Hall, New Zealand leader and head guide. Mike Groom, Australia guide. Andy Harris, New Zealand guide. Doug Hansen, USA client. John Krakauer, USA client and journalist. Beck Weathers, USA client. Lou Kashishki, USA client. Yasuko Namba, Japan client. Dr. Stuart Hutchison, Canada client. Frank Pishbeck, Hong Kong client Dr. John Tosk Australia client Susan Allen Australia tracker Nancy Hutchison Canada tracker Dr. Caroline McKenzie New Zealand base camp doctor Helen Wilton New Zealand base camp manager Ang Dorje Sharfa, Nepal, Climbing Sardar. In addition, there were 10 Sharfas who were assisting the expedition. Among the client was John Krakauer, a journalist on assignment from Outside magazine. Hall had brokered a deal with Outside for guiding one of their writers to the summits. 
in exchange for advertising space and a story about the growing popularity of commercial expedition to Everest. Before leaving base camp, Rob Hall and Scott Fisher convened a meeting of guides from both teams, during which they agreed that each expedition would dispatch two Sherpas, including the climbing Sardars, Ang Dorje and Lap Singh Jangbo Sherpa, from Camp 4, 90 minutes ahead of the main groups. This would give the Sherpas time to install fixed lines on the most exposed section of the upper mountain before the clients arrived. It came two for the night. However, when Bukrib reached Camp 1, he found Del Cruz in bad shape in one of the tents. Cruz was hoping to rest off, possibly spending the night there instead of going up to Camp 2 as planned. When Bukrib reached Camp 2, he reported Cruz's condition to Fisher and Fisher decided that Cruz had to go down. So Fisher descended to Camp 1 and took Cruz back down to base camp. Bukrib had offered to take Cruz down but Fisher preferred to do it himself since Cruz was a personal friend. Lapsing Jangbo Sherpa was one of the strongest members of any group he climbed with, even though he never used supplemental oxygen. On May 9, he exhausted himself carrying a satellite phone for Sandy Helfetman in addition to the rest of his load from Camp 3 to Camp 4 apparently on Scott's orders. Starting around midnight and May 10, Bokreep Neil Bidelman, Scott Fisher and Sherpas began guiding the six remaining clients to the summit, starting from Camp 4 on the South Goal. Lapsing Jangbo towed Pittman on a short trip for five or six hours above the South Goal, substantially fatigued and prevented himself from assuming his rule in the lead, establishing the route. Lop Singh's unexpected absence from the head of the line had a bearing on the day's outcome. Precious time was wasted near the south summit and held restep, and the safe turnaround time was not adhered to which proved battle eventually. His decision to short through Batman provoked criticism. According to Lop Singh, Scott wanted all members to go to summit and I thought Sandy would be the weakest member. I thought she would be slow, so I took her first. Lop Singh was extremely devoted to Peshur, and he understood how important it was for Scott to get Batman to the summit. At 5.30 am, Ang Dorje and some of the members of Hall's expedition arrived at the balcony. They were more than an hour in front of the rest of the group. At that point, they could easily have gone ahead to install the ropes, but Rob had explicitly forbidden them to go ahead, and lapsing was still far below, short roping Batman. As time passed, the crowd stacked up at the south summit. Around 11.40 am, Alarm at the growing crowd, Anatoly Bukriev, Neil Bidelman, and Andy Harris strongly suggested that the three guides install the ropes themselves. At noon, they got underway to Pax Lines up the summit ridge, but by then, another hour had already gone fast. Bukriev was ahead of his team and reached the summit at around 1 pm, where he waited for others. By 2.30 pm, only two out of eight climbers had reached the peak. Concerned about the others, Bukreep went down to find out whether there were some problems. Unnecessary delays at the south summit caused by fax roofs not being set up by the climbing Sherpas by the time the team had reached that point 
had cast the team hours of daylight. Just below the summit, he saw Rob Hall, and then fast pour up his ascending clients. Bukrip met Scott Fisher near Hildry Strip at around 2.30 p.m. They talked to each other. Bukrip asked him about his health. He replied that he was very tired and that it was hard for him to climb. They agreed that Bukrib would go down to Kempur as soon as possible to arm himself and get a supply of hard drink and oxygen in case he might need to go back up the mountain to assist the descending clients. The climbing route was well visible from the south coal and he could follow the situation on the mountain. Looking at the sky, they didn't notice any reason to worry. Bukrib made it back to Camp 4 at 5 p.m. After consulting with Fisher ahead of the clients to prepare tea and food upon their return. All six clients of Mountain Madness eventually reached the summit, but much later than what was considered a safe turn around time, typically 2 p.m. Reaching the summit by 2 p.m. ensured that there was enough time to make it back to Kempur before it got dark. Fisher reached the summit after 3.45 p.m., much later than the safe run around time. Lapsing Jangbo Sherpa was waiting for him at the top. Fisher was exhausted from the ascent and became increasingly ill, possibly suffering from half has or a combination of both. Around that time, Makaluga and two Sherpas of the Taiwanese team arrived at the summit. Rob Hall was also on the summit waiting for Doug Hansen to arrive as the weather was turning bad. Around 4 pm, Hansen finally appeared moving up fully slowly. Hall hurried down to help him the final 40 feet to the summit. Both stayed only a minute or two at the summit and then turned to begin the long descent. Around 5 pm, a blizzard struck the southwest face of Everest, dropping visibility and obliterating the trail back to Camp 4 at the south goal. Winds were blowing at 75 miles per hour. Snow was coming down so hard that they couldn't see more than a couple of steps ahead, and they had to scream to be heard by someone standing at their side. Temperatures had plummeted. They were disoriented, and as panic began to set in, Bridal men fought to keep the team calm and together. The storm that ruled in caused many difficulties on the descent, including several clients getting lost in well up the normal descent route. Below the south summit, members of Adventure Consultant and Mountain Madness were trapped by the storm. These climbers had managed to get this far because of the superhuman dedication shown by guide Neil Bidelman literally helped drag five climbers down the south summit as far as he could. He guided Sandy Fetman, Charlotte Fox and Tim Madsen. He also dragged Yasuku Namba and Big Feathers from the Adventure Consultant team down as far as he could, literally dragging everyone if they stopped, all while battling a raging storm. He then stopped and left the climbers in a relatively safe location and headed for Camp 4 in search of health. Anatoly Bukrib, who was at Camp 4, preferred to meet the returning clients. When no one returned by 6 pm, he began to worry. Having no radio link, he took a thermos of hot tea and carried three cylinders of oxygen and went up to locate the missing climbers. 
yet the advancing storm didn't make it easy. Due to poor visibility and having no idea where they might be, Bukrip returned to Camp 4. At around 9 pm, Martin Adams returned to Camp 4 but he was too weak to speak. Later, three other team members, Neil Bidelman, Lenny Gamelgaard, and Clip Shawning, found their way down to Camp 4 and collapsed. They were shaking from hypothermia. They told Book Reeve about Charlotte Fox, Tim Madsen, Sandy Helfetman, Yasuko Namba, and Big Feathers, who were hopelessly lost in the storm not far from the camp. Lapsing Jangbo Sharpa appeared and told Anatoly Bukrib that pressure had collapsed and stuck at around 8,500 meters. Due to a pure storm raging outside, those who returned to Camp 4 at the South Coal were not ready to mount a rescue mission. Everyone was either too exhausted or simply understood that going out in a blizzard would be fatal. In search of assistance, Bukrip went around all the neighboring tents, looking at Rob Hall's clients, his sherfas, and Taiwanese. He looked into the first tent. Can anyone help me? Silence. Yasukunamba and Big Feathers are in danger. Will any of you come with me to them? Silence again. Then he went to the second and third tent, but couldn't get help. Then he saw a tent of surfers from Hall's expedition and went there. Finally, someone responded to him. Anatoly told them, Yasuko Namba and Big Weathers need help. Your expedition should provide support. I need any one of you to go with me to rescue the clients. Get ready to go out. Then he went to the Taiwanese tents. No one answered him there. Bukrip never managed to get support from the members of Rob Hall's expedition. And this was not the first request for help left unanswered. Despite extremely harsh and dangerous conditions, Anatoly Bukrip made an attempt and saved three lives that night alone. Five climbers needed help and only Bukrip was willing to go out. He went after the stranded climbers with hot tea and supplemental oxygen. He made numerous trips in the storm and led and in some cases dragged Sandy Helfetman, Charlotte Fox and T. Madsen back to camp. He repeatedly asked Sherpas and members of other expedition to help save Yaskunamba and Big Feathers, but no one would help. Gamal God remembers seeing Book Reap after he returned with Fox and Madsen. I woke up at around 5 am and saw Anatoly Book Reap. He had returned. It was already light and he said without saying a word. He was completely exhausted. There was no energy left in him. And then I clearly understood that he brought back Tim, Charlotte and Sandy, but couldn't do anything for Yasuko Namba and Big Feathers who remained there on the saddle. By 4.30 am on Saturday, the whole team had met at Tukampur except Scott Pesher. Pesher left the summit at about 4 pm descended with lapsing Jangbu Sherpa part of the way when the storm engulfed the upper slopes of the mountain. Gasping, he hauled himself along the southeast ridge balcony. At 6 pm, just above the balcony, lapsing, who had stayed behind to aid others in trouble, caught up with Scott. 
seeing that Scott had taken off his mask, lapsing foot at back over his face and made sure he was breathing oxygen. But the words Scott's uttered were further proof of his deterioration. According to Lapsing, he said, I'm very sick, too sick to go down. I'm going to jump. He said many times, acting like a crazy man. So I tied him on rope quickly, otherwise, he was jumping down into the Tibet. Short roping Scott, Lapsing got him some 300 feet farther down the ridge before Scott collapsed, unable to walk. Lapsing hankered beside his team leader on a small snow-covered ledge, preparing to spend the night with him. Pesher told him to go down and send help. At 8 pm, another climber appeared out of the darkness. It was Makaluga, the leader of the Taiwanese expedition, accompanied by two of his team Sherpas. Equally flared out, Makalu settled onto the same ledge, freeing his Sherpas to head down to the south call. For another hour, Lopsing shared the vigil with Makalu and Scott, even while he got so cold that he doubted his own chances of survival. But Scott once more urged him, You go down, send up an atulibu grave. Lapsing left pressure on the mountain, promising he would send help. He said, Don't get out of here. I'll send you sherfas with oxygen and tea. No matter how bad Lapsing was, he was aware that the sherpas of mountain madness did not want to go off. His last hope was an Atuli book reap, but he just learned about five clients in distress near the camp, and three of them were from Mountain Madness. Book reap couldn't cope with everything alone. In a frigid whiteout and battling extreme gales, Scott remained on the snow about 50 meters below the balcony. The next morning, two Sherfas from Scott's team, Tashi Teshring and Nawang Sherfa, headed back up the ridge to try to rescue Scott. Despite the pummeling wind, they forced their way up to the bivouac ledge. There they found Scott barely breathing, his eyes fixed in a vacant stare. They tried to administer oxygen but it seemed to do no good. Scott was in deep coma. His chances of survival were slim. The Sherpas left him bundled up with an oxygen bottle. He was a thousand vertical feet above the safety of the South Coal, but he might as well have been on the far side of the moon. Makalu was in almost as bad shape but he was able to drink some tea and breathe from the bottles of oxygen the Sherpas had brought off. In another heroic rescue effort, Tashi and Nawang put Makalu on a short rope and got him down to the south goal. Having failed to rouse Scott and get him moving downward, the Sherpas had in effect given him up for dead. But Anatoly Bukriyev couldn't believe it, and though near exhaustion himself, he set out at 5 pm, only a little more than an hour before dark, to make one last effort to save Scott. It was not till 7.30 or 8 pm that he reached the bivouac ledge. On his way of he saw that Big Feathers had somehow managed to find the camp, truly a miracle. There, in the beam of his headlamp, he found Scott Fisher, but unfortunately he had died. My last hopes were broken. 
I could do absolutely nothing to help him. Book Reeve recalled. Scott had exhibited paradoxical undressing, commonly associated with hypothermia. He had wrapped up his oxygen mask in gloves and often his down jacket. Bukrieb shrouded Fisher's upper torso and moved his body up the main climbing route. Then he descended to the south goal. It's believed that Scott was in the grips of cerebral edema, fluid buildup in the brain, causing extreme confusion and loss of coordination. The hallucination that he could jump back to camp is a typical manifestation of the ailment. Yet because he was the expedition leader, there was no one else in a position to recognize Scott's condition and send him down. The very edema probably prevented Scott from recognizing what a predicament he was in. He simply thought he was tired feeling ill, just having a bad day. There was no reason for him to go to the summit, but it would have been unthinkable for him to let the clients go up without him. Two days later on Monday, Gao and Beckwithers were airlifted from the mountain by a Nepalese helicopter. In all, Eight climbers perished in the storm high on Everest that day, five on the south and three on the north side of the mountain. Scott Pesher, Rob Hall, Andy Harris, Doug Henson, Yasko Namba, Seven Faljor, Dorje Morov, and Seven Smalla never made it back. The latter three were part of the Indo-Tibetan border police expedition attempting the mountain from the north side. John Krakauer, a journalist and member of Rob Hall's expedition, did much to undermine Book Reeve. In his book, And to Thin Air, in other publications, he argued that Bukrib was responsible for leaving his clients behind and not using supplemental oxygen that many used to avoid the dangerous effects of hypoxia at high altitude. Even though Scott Fisher gave him permission to do so, does Anatoly Bukrib really think that it was in his clients' best interest for him to climb without using supplemental oxygen? Anatoly was a remarkably strong climber at altitude, but he was paid $25,000 US to perform as a guide, and oxygen would have certainly allowed him to think more clearly and assess clients much more readily. Or does Anatoly somehow believe that he was stronger without oxygen than with it? Krakauer wrote, Ryan Holmesner criticized the book Reeb, saying, No one should guide Everest without using bottled oxygen. While David Brashears pointed out that book Reeb, despite climbing down first, was sitting in his tent unable to assist anyone until the clients themselves staggered into the camp with the information vital to their rescue. According to Krakauer, Bukrieb's refusal or inability to play the role of a conventional guide caused dissension between him and Scott Fisher. On the way to the summit, Fisher had directed Bukrieb to bring up the rear of the group and keep an eye on everybody. But he instead remained at base camp and followed the group some five hours later. When a client named Dale Cruz fell ill, Bukrieb was nowhere to be found, forcing Fisher to descend from Camp 2 to Crows and help him back to base camp. As per Krakauer, 
Fisher encountered book rape at the Kumbu Ice Pal and harshly reprimanded the guide for shirking his responsibilities. Back at base camp, Fisher called his Seattle business partner Karen Dickinson and publicist Jane Bramit to complain about book rape's actions before resuming his ascent. According to Gary Weston DeWalt, co-author of The Climb, John Krakauer needed a villain. He thought that Anatoly was Russian, he would go home, and he can't speak English very well. So he thought there would be no problems. What he didn't calculate was the scale of the resulting effects. Bukri preferred to climb without supplemental oxygen because he believed it was safer. It would help him avoid the sudden loss of climatization that happens when supplementary oxygen supplies are depleted. I have been climbing for more than 25 years and use supplemental oxygen only once climbing an 8000 meters mountain. I never had difficulties because of a lack of supplemental oxygen, Book Reap noted in his book. Despite Krakauer's persistent attacks, Book Reap's courage was still recognized by many fellow alpinists. Galen Rowell, an American mountaineer and photojournalist, later wrote in the Wall Street Journal. While Mr. Krakauer slept and no other guide, client or Sherpa could muster the strength and courage to leap camp, Bukri made several solo forays into a blizzard in the dark at 26,000 feet to rescue three climbers near death. Although John Krakauer grants Bukri certain strengths, he never finds the big picture of one of the most amazing rescue and mountaineering history perform single-handedly by Book Reef a few hours after climbing Everest without the aid of bottle oxygen. Book Reef had topped many of the world's highest peaks solo. In less than one day, inventor and always without bottle oxygen because of his personal ethics. Having already done Everest twice, he foresaw problems with clients nearing camp. Noted five other guides on the peak and positioned himself to be rested and hydrated enough to respond to an emergency. His heroism was not a fluke. Those who knew Anatoly were aware of how responsible person he was and how attentive he was to training in his physical shape. He started working with Mountain Madness and made it clear that he would climb without supplemental oxygen. It was a well-known fact and those who worked with him believed in his preparation and experience. He had an incredible physiology, not the same as most climbers. So when people criticize Anatoly for not using supplemental oxygen, they usually don't take into account facts, information about his training, experience, and his physical shape. On the summit day, he carried a canister of supplemental oxygen with him, and the other two were dumped at the south summit in case he needed it. But he did not need them. So there was a back of land just in case he needed bottle oxygen. The journalist also wrote that Anatoly communicated little with clients and did not tell them everything they should know about the tav. And his clothes were not warm enough. If it wasn't for such a negligent attitude, he saved not only his clients, but also those to whom he did not have time to get. Book Reap's supporters point to the fact that he was the bravest member of the entire expedition. 
but the screens showed absolutely different history that the United States know. At that time, all publication of the world wrote about the tragedy. Although John Krakauer was a well-prepared climber, but he had no experience of climbing the highest mountains on the planet. After the tragedy on May 10, the world read not about extreme commercial mountaineering, but about the main villain of the entire expedition, and that character was Bukriev. Anatoly's daring effort and rescue earned him a letter of commendation from the U.S. Congress for saving its citizens. Later, the American Alpine Club awarded Anatoly Bukriev the David Souls Award, the highest award for courage for his efforts to bring Sandy Hill Pittman, Charlotte Fox, and Tim Madsen back to Kempur alive. It was presented to him by Jim Wequier, the first American to summit K2. Later, many recognized that had he not gone down to Camp 4 before the weather worsened, he simply wouldn't have been able to help and would probably have died. Tired and without oxygen, he would have been of no help to others who suffered. Much can be said about Bokriyev's life, his numerous climbing records and patience toward mountaineering. That rescue mission at 8,000 meters by a man who had just climbed to the summit of Avis without oxygen was remarkable enough. Even more extraordinary was Bokriyev's action on the following day when he climbed back up to 8,400 meters in a forlorn attempt to rescue Scott Fisher. It was too late, for his friend had already died, but Bukrib was able to bring back some mementos for Fisher's family. But public opinion was divided, all influenced by the book by John Krakauer. As per Anatoly's supporters, Krakauer's claims were all the more surprising. Anatoly was the conductor of the other team, all his clients survived. If the journalist was concerned about the death of his comrades, then claims should be made to the guides of the whole expedition, the one who stayed at the top and the one who was able to get alive. Bokriyev should not have worried about the competitor's team, but he helped them only because there was a spirit of mutual assistance in him. Italian alpinist Simone Moro disagreed with Jan Krakauer's portrayal of Bokriyev. Moro explained to Jan Krakauer, You didn't understand who Anatoly really was. You are American, he was Russian. You were new to 8,000 meter fix, he was the best of all time at these altitudes. He had climbed 21 times to a summit over 8,000 meters. You were a normal alpinist, he was a fantastic athlete and survival's animal. You are economically sure, he knew hunger. In my opinion, you are like a man who, after reading a book about medicines, pretends to teach one of the world's most famous and capable surgeons how to be a doctor. When judging the decision made by Anatoly in 1996, you must remember this. No clients have his team died. Shocked by the acquisition, in January 1997, Bukriyev gave his expedition logs, personal journals, letters and memories to Gary Weston D. Walt, whom then collected all the information into a book called The Climb. 
The claim was a response to some of the accusations made by John Krakauer in his book concerning the decision and actions by Anatoly Bukhriev. In the claim, Bukhriev cited his own version of the tragedy and Everest. The first edition of the book was published in November 1997. If the world had not taken interest in what had happened on Everest, perhaps Bukhrieb's story would never have been told. After a memorial service at the base camp, in one final gesture of defiance, Bukhrieb demonstrated his phenomenal stamina by speeding back up to make a day ascent of Everest's neighbor. Lutze, the fourth highest mountain in the world. He decided on a solo ascent because he hoped that in the process of climbing it, he might find some inner clarity to what had just transpired on Everest. He also climbed Shoyo and Shishapangma that same year. On the 7th of July 1997, Bukhrieb made a solo ascent of Bradfik in Pakistan. And exactly one week later, he completed a speed ascent of nearby Gesherbun 2. He completed the climb of Gesherbun 2 in an astonishing 9 hours and 30 minutes. In just 80 days, he climbed 4 peaks above 8,000 meters. Although climbing all 14 8,000 meter mountain wasn't particularly important to Bukhrieb, he had ascended 11 of them. Only Nangafarbat, Geshar Brumbwand, and Anafurna one remained. As part of another expedition on Everest in 1997, he again climbed the same route. Brown Scott Fisher's body, stone it, and took an ice axe to pass it to his family as a sign of memory. In the summer of 1997, Anatoly Bukhrieb invited Reinhold Messner to join him in the tension for some recreational climbing. During Messner's visit, Bukhrieb asked the legendary Italian alpinist for advice about his climbing career. Since first visiting the Himalaya in 1989, Bukhrieb had accumulated an amazing record of high altitude ascents. Messner pointed out that if Bukhrieb wanted to be considered among the world's truly great mountaineers, he would need to shape his focus to steeper very typical, previously unclimbed lines. Anatoly took this advice to heart. In fact, even before consulting with Messner, Bukhrieb and Simone Moro, an accomplished Italian alpinist, had decided to attempt Anafurna 1 via a notoriously typical route on the mountain's south base that had been climbed by a strong Anglo-American team in 1970. And to increase the challenge, Bukhrieb and Muru decided to make their attempt on Anafurna in winter. It would be an exceedingly ambitious and dangerous undertaking, involving extreme technical climbing at high altitude and unimaginable wind and cold. Even when ascended by its easiest routes, Annapurna is regarded as one of the deadliest mountains in the world. If Bukhrieb and Muru were to succeed, it would be one of the boldest ascents in the history of Himalayan mountaineering. Annapurna 1 was the first 8,000 meter peaks to be climbed. The first winter ascent of Napurna 1 was made by Polish climbers Erzik Kochka and Artur Heiser in February 1987. 
In late November 1997, Bukrib and Mu traveled to Nepal in a helicopter to Annapurna base camp. Accompanied by a Kazakh cinematographer named Dmitry Sobolov, who was documenting the climb. It had been an unusually early winter, however. They were hit by frequent storms and giant avalanches thundering down their intended route. As a consequence, a month into the expedition, they decided to abandon their original plan and instead attempt a different route at the eastern margin of Annapurna's south base. It was a route that had been attempted several times by accomplished climbers without success. The difficulties would be extreme. Bukrib's team would have to ascend a formidable satellite peak called the Fung on their way to the summit. But the avalanche danger appeared to be significantly lower on this new route. Having erected Camp 1 at 17,000 feet below the first of the new route's steep terrain, Bukrib, Muru, and Sobolov embark from their tent at sunrise on the 25th of December 1997, intending to establish a line of fake roofs up a broad gully to a ridge that towered some 2,700 feet above their camp. Moru, in the lead, had climbed to within 200 feet of the ridge crest by noon. At 12.27 p.m., as he stopped to pull something from his backpack, he heard a sharp boom. When he looked up, he saw a massive avalanche of ice blocks rumbling down directly toward him. He managed to scream out a warning to Bukrib and Sobolo, who were ascending the gully some 700 feet below. Just before the wall of snow and ice floored him from his stance and carried him down the mountain. For a moment, Moru tried to arrest his slide by clutching the fake rope, burning deep gouges into his fingers and forms, but it was to no avail. He tumbled approximately 2,600 feet with the cascading ice and was knocked cold. Moro had somehow stayed near the top of the avalanche debris and managed to dig himself out after a few minutes. Unable to see or hear any signs of Bukrib or Sobolov, Moro descended to Annapurna base camp where he was flown by helicopter back to Kathmandu for surgery on his hands, which had been ripped down to the tendons during the fall. Having learned about the tragedy by phone from Moro on December 26, Linda Wiley got on a plane and flew to Nepal on December 28. She hired a helicopter and began to fly around the route. Hope lingered for Book Reef and his photographer for more than a week as weather hampered helicopter search efforts. Lieutenant Colonel Madan KC, who became famous for the daring helicopter rescue of Big Weathers in Makalugo of Everest in 1996, flew at least two helicopter search mission to reach the avalanche site, but inclement weather in late December prevented search teams from reaching Camp 1. There was some hope that perhaps Bukrib and Sobolov had managed to reach Camp 1. However, on the 3rd of January 1998, a ground party of Sherpas and Kazakh climbers found no sign of the missing men when they reached Camp 1 and an empty tent. Linda Wiley subsequently issued a somber statement from Kathmandu. This is the end. There is no longer any hope of finding him alive. I only hope the searchers will locate his body for a proper burial in a crevasse. Anatoly would like to stay in the mountains. The bodies were never found. 
A year later, Linda Valley organized another search expedition, but it also did not bring results. Anatoly Bukrib had dreamt in detail of dying in an avalanche nine months before his death. The only thing missing was the name of the mountain. When Bukrib's companions tried to convince him to take a different path in life to avoid a pet that Bukrib was convinced of, he responded, Mountains are my life, my work. It is too late for me to take up another road. Anatoly Bukrib was one of the outstanding high altitude mountaineers of his day. Brought up in the hard school of Soviet climbing, he developed a resilience which few Western mountaineers could match. His high altitude achievements, including climbing in extreme condition as well as alone, have no analogues. His death was a great loss for mountaineering community in Kazakhstan, Russia and the world. In 1999, Linda Valley erected a memorial chortan to the Apollon climber in the base camp of Anafurna. Linda put up the monument and a stone book reap sat on for a long time before his last ascent. One of Bukrib's favorite quotes has inscribed on the memorial flag. Mountains are not stadiums where I satisfy my ambitions to achieve. They are the cathedrals where I practice my religion. In 1999, Linda Valley became the founder of the Bukrib Memorial Fund which helps young climbers from Kazakhstan conquer Mount McKinley. With the help of the same fund, young Americans have the opportunity to go to the northernmost 7,000 on the planet, Hantengri in the Tian Shan mountain range in Kazakhstan. This is not only a system to novice athletes, but also the development of relations between the two countries. Linda published the book Above the Clouds, Diaries of a High Altitude Climber, in which she collected entries from mountain magazines and diaries of Bukrib himself, made from 1989 to 1997. On the 18th of January 2023, a sculpture of Bukri by Nurlan Dalbai was unveiled at the Meadow Ice Sports Rings. The mountaineer is shown at rest with his hand on an ice axe. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you like this video, Please consider subscribing to the channel for more such content to come in the future.